Okay, any questions to start? Okay, so while we're getting folks to come down, I had a, just a couple of questions for each of our panelists. So um, the first one goes back to um, James uh, at the beginning in terms of looking at what um, Evan Smith was bringing up earlier today in terms of looking at the, the models for making money <laughs> in journalism today. I mean, he was saying that, you know, foundations now are, are giving money to organizations, of course, to help them get going. Um, but he was also talking about this being the beginning. So do you see this as a, in terms of where we are right now internationally, as a beginning or as an, as an ending in terms of how are they going to be sustainable and where they can get those funds from? Uh, I think realist. I think he's realistic in saying that it, you know it's a long-term thing. It's a long-term play, but that means that all the foundations have to change the way that they think about this. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, internationally, because there is not that same kind of culture of uh, foundations and the, the tax breaks, et cetera, they don't have this sort of infra infrastructure. Um, so I, I think that you'll see more of a kind of what I was describing as a kind of a relationship model, which does work in places like Spain and Holland and uh, Malaysia, uh, where the journalists focus on uh, going deep and uh, just uh, taking advantage of a small percentage of the audience who's really engaged and to focus on that really s that small percentage, which seems to be what uh, was working uh, also for the New York Times with their digital that they're, they're getting most of their money, I, I think, from a very small percentage. Uh, I think 90% of the digital revenue comes from 10% of the audience or something like that. So that's, I think, what's going to happen. Okay. We've got our first question over there. So, Mine is actually very basic on the virtual reality. I was just curious, how long does that take to train somebody to do that? And how long does it take to actually do it? Okay, so... Could I, Lynn, just follow up and then we can sit down? Because my question was, how would you decide whether the investment of time and energy is worth it for a particular story? Is it based on who you're trying to reach in terms of the audience, or is it based on uh, telling the story effectively? How do you make the decision to use this set of tools? Okay, I, I think the story is going to dictate it, you know, and your audience. So, how long did it take? Well, Gwinnett is a real, you, you can't do this unless you have somebody who really understands how to do the virtual world stuff. She knows every little bit about it. So, that's the first thing. You need that person to be there. Then she took Worked with two students over the summer. There are two computer science students. By the way, the students from this were total inter, uh, interdisciplinary. They came from media studies. They came from English, one uh, African American studies, <clears throat> and a couple journalists and a couple PR people. So it was a really good mix. And but she worked with the two students to do the kid to cop the punch, and that took uh, pretty much the summer. Fortunately, towards the end. Um, Christina Guerra came in, and she's a media arts student, and she did the editing. And so it's just like making a real movie, actually. Any, if, you, if you think, I want to go do a video about a story, you can do the same thing on this, because it's similar kind of camera work, similar kind of editing. It's just it's happening in-world, but you have to kind of construct the in-world thing. And so for us, the reason why we wanted to do that well, there's a lot of kids whose stories we would like to eventually tell. We got sidetracked because of this Christopher Thomas thing. We couldn't let that go. But the original plan was to bring uh, young kids in and keep them anonymous, but tell their story, let them tell their story, and then act the story out just as exactly if it happened, if they'd been in solitary confinement or you know, were pushed out of the house or whatever it is. We, we could show that 100%. And so the more adept you get at it, the faster you can be. But Gwyneth, are you around now or not? Yes, I'm here. Uh, so what, what do you think in terms of time? Can you hear my voice? Perfectly. OK. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that the basic set of skills that you need to do this type of development, you don't need to learn how to build. Because as I mentioned, there's lots of free uh, Creative Commons assets online that you can upload into the world very easily. And the process of uploading is simple to learn. And what you need to learn to do is move objects around and have an eye for setting them and 
locations and next to each other and looking at Google Maps and seeing what you're seeing really looks like in the real world if you need to replicate something. So things can be done pretty rapidly if you don't have to develop something specific from scratch. We developed the pawn shop, for instance, specifically to match a picture. So that takes a little bit more time. But uh, that building, for instance, that you saw in the kid, the cop, the punch, where the kids stole the stuff, to do that exterior and interior and a little bit of area around it, because that was a single scene that wasn't immersed in a whole block of development, that probably took uh, maybe 10 hours of actual time once you know what you're doing and you're building. To learn the building skill set, it depends on whether or not you know other 3D modeling tools. But uh, believe me, it's not hard to master. I came to it a complete novice to 3D modeling, and I was just so enraptured by it as an artist that I taught myself, and there's lots of really good tutorials to learn how to build. Uh, but the project, whether a story is suitable or not, I think what Lynn wants to do, uh, telling stories where anonymity is important, I think it's perfect for that. Because the kids themselves, or your, your primary characters themselves, can help direct the story. You could even use their voices with some voice modification, but they can actually help you develop the set that's going to tell their story, and I think that's uh, significantly important. And there's two, there, yeah, there's two other things, too, that, that you should be thinking about. One is cost. So Gwinnett is like total open source person. So she used OpenSim. It, and to produce this thing in terms of equipment and all, it's very, very cheap. You, know? you just need a, com a decent computer, and you can start doing that. You can't do that with most of the other things in virtual worlds. It's going to cost you fifty, sixty, seventy, a hundred thousand dollars $100,000 to get started. This thing, we had, the equipment was not an obstacle. It was very inexpensive. So that's the one thing to kind of keep in mind that you can do this you know, relatively cheaply. Thank you, Gwinnett and Lynn. Leonard. So Susan, I had a question for you in terms of digital security. You were talking about next steps and looking at how we can move forward um, of removing this aspect of digital ops security through obscurity. So what would be a way in which digital security training could be done in a newsroom and in the classroom in higher ed? Um, thank you. That's a great question. So I mean, this is something that we are looking at um, various ways to integrate at Columbia Journalism School. And I actually wanted to sort of give a shout out. The, the New York Times actually was one of the first, uh, about three weeks ago, hired uh, Runa Sandvik, who is a well-known information security expert, um, as their newsroom information security lead. Um, so this is something that we're actually starting to see happen in larger news organizations, which is the idea of having someone whose job it is to, to take this on. Um, and you know, I think that uh, you know it, it's something that can be done quite directly. I mean, as the quote from our participant showed, you know, if you have a tech department that is capable of kind of translating these messages, it's something where you know you can come together and do it right there in the newsroom. Um, from a higher ed perspective, I think where I see as an educator, where I see the opportunity to integrate this is. It takes a little bit of thinking, but it's to actually in, embed it into uh, discussions about reporting and data storage and all of that as it goes, right? So at the moment that you're teaching, you know, students how to, you know, use cameras and manage, you know, the many, many files, the photo files that they get or um, transmit information to you as a professor or, um, you know, among themselves, it's actually where you introduce these things. So I've done a lot of sessions for colleagues. Um, they usually take about 90 minutes. A lot of the, a lot of the major things that we're talking about are what I would call set and forget. Um, things like turning on two-factor authentication is something that uh, is easier to do now than it ever has been. Um, you really do it once. You have it saved on your most commonly used devices. And most of us will almost never notice again that we have that set up, except for the fact that your account will get hacked. So um, you know, I think it's something that, that is best introduced at the beginning, integrated with the tasks that it applies to. Um, and that's really the key. Okay, Thank you, Susan. Next question I have is for Jeremy. So in terms of looking at the conversation about interactivity, social presence, and journalists, and getting beyond the conversation, are journalists interactive? <laughs> We've always been interactive. <laughs> Digital platform just didn't make that happen. So I mean, in moving the conversation forward, been there, done that, Like, where do we see now the idea of, of engagement, and how can we identify ways in which um, journalists can use these platforms to their advantage to bring that engagement and, and have those important relationships and conversations with their publics? I think that's a really meaningful question, especially if some of you may have seen the, the news in the last couple of days that was talking about how um, social referrals to news are not driving traffic to off of Twitter. 
And um, I think there was a lot of I told you so's from the people who didn't want to be on Twitter in the first place. Um, so, you know, it, I, I think it, hopefully <laughs> we're going to get to the point where we stop talking about this idea that we're using Twitter basically to drive links to our website. Um, and that is an engagement issue. Like, what is Twitter good for? And um, I, you know, we're seeing more in the, I, I would say probably more progress in the last couple of years around the conversation of it, that Twitter is a listening tool. It's, it's a tool for um, not just hearing from our followers, but also following people back and finding what people are talking about and generating story ideas and, and taking different perspectives upon the news stories we're producing. Um, stuff that Dan Gilmore was talking about back in 2005 when he was writing We The, we the Media, you know, this idea that we're, we're mining our audience for perspectives that we're not getting. Um, I would like, you know, it, it, mere interaction, I, I feel like has been like this thing we've been, tra we've been chasing in, 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 in conferences like this where we've been talking about for a while and hoping that journalists will finally wake up to the idea that we can talk back. But I think the next level past that really is about how can we, how can we, we use those relationships with, with audience to make our content better, um, to, to improve the user experience around the news that we're generating, and to, to really um, figure out how journalists are part of an ecosystem, not necessarily the people who are driving that ecosystem, which I think is, you know, when you think about it just in terms of link sharing, that you, it's, that's a skewed view of, for you of it. So. Well, thank you. I don't want to keep you guys from drinks and food. So I just want to give a big round of applause to our researchers and their work today.